Music is a part of worship. But for worship to be really what God intends it to be. There's got to be something that comes from deep inside. That begins to express to our creator. What he really means to us. How much we love him. I looked around in this auditorium tonight and we sang that old song, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I noticed uh, Brother and Sister Davis, they may have had to leave a little early, but Brother Bud Davis from here, just a couple of weeks ago underwent surgery. But tonight, with God's people, he and Sister Davis undergoing some physical things in their lives. I look over here and see Brother Allen underwent bypass surgery. Brother Allen, wave your hand at me. We're blessed, Brother Allen. We're blessed. And then I look at all of you. You look so good tonight. I wonder where, I'm not going to refer to you, but I wonder where I would be if it were not for the church tonight. If it were not for this glorious gospel that has touched us and kept us. I don't know where I would have been, but it would have been much different than it is today. I might have been just somewhere in the rice fields of Louisiana. Never knew what I know tonight. But I think something needs to settle over us tonight. A thankfulness. I look at men that, listen, far beyond our abilities tonight. And more than we deserve. God has put his hand on us. I wonder tonight if you could lift your hand and really worship him right now. Would you thank him? It's the ordination service. We have two ministers tonight that will be ordained. For the Donald Martinez, he and his wife are seated on the front row. And brother and sister Jason Sisko. And what a great time it is. What a wonderful time. What a meaningful time. Ordination. Steps through the ministry that from the very first call of God on your life. And then to feel that hand of God as it led you to where you are right now. These men come seasoned ministers of the gospel. Men who have proven their ministry and have brought to this moment a confirmation of the hand of God upon their lives. But tonight, we go a step further with the ordination or the laying on of hands of the presbytery that will move them into an era of ministry that they have sought for. So this is not just any service, but an important part. Now it's going to do something to us tonight. Because we're going to remember back those of us that are ordained. And some things are going to be refreshed to us tonight. About this wonderful privilege of being a part of the ministry 
of God's great church. Our speaker for tonight, our preacher, it is, it is my honor to introduce him tonight. Our general superintendent means so much to us, to every one of us. And leadership is so important. And God has laid a mantle of leadership upon our general superintendent. He has a word from the Lord for us tonight. I want him to come to this pulpit and preach with anointing. And I want him to feel from this congregation a hunger. Brother Haney, we're hungry to hear what thus saith the Lord. Because in that word of the Lord, there is direction. There's healing. There is instruction. Everything we need, the bread of life, will supply to us. So, Brother Haney, it is our honor in the Texas District to have you and preach to us tonight what the Lord has given you. I love you. I love you. Thank you, Brother Russell, and praise the Lord, everyone. How wonderful it is to be in the Texas district tonight, and I give honor to our superintendent, Brother Russell, and our district secretary, Brother Prince. As a matter of fact, I was officiating in the um, district conference when both of these men were elected to office, and I want to tell you that you elected a tremendous team. I've, I've marveled at the way that they've led this district. You're going places, and uh, you had the mind of God. I appreciate the district board, wonderful board, and the ministers here, many of them my friends. If I start naming, and our missionaries tonight, each one uh, will be here a little while. And then you wonderful ministers and wives that are present here tonight. And I especially give honor to Brother and Sister Martinez, Brother and Sister Cisco, who will be ordained in this service. While many of my remarks will be directed to their ministry, it will be directed to all of us. We're still in, on the journey. And uh, as long as we're here, I was uh, one of our ministers, I won't name him, we all revere him, but the devil had been talking to him, and he felt like he should be dead, and that he should go on, and he didn't know why he was still around. I got wind of it. Uh, somebody called me, so I picked up the phone, and I called him, and I said, you're here for a purpose. And if God did not have a purpose for your life, he'd just kill you. So you better thank God you're still here. And I'm going to say this to all of us tonight. We're here because God has a plan for our life. And we need to stay involved in the work of the Lord as long as the Lord allows us to be here and give him our very best. So this evening, if you have your Bibles, I'm inviting your attention to the epistle of Second Peter and chapter 3. And I want to talk to you about the long journey to promise. The long journey to promise, it indeed is a journey to promise. And um, God has given us a promise. We refer to it often as a, a dream. And I know sometimes uh, religious people, and especially in the charismatic realm, they talk a lot about dreams, but dreams is very much scriptural and predicated upon scripture. That is the kind of dream I would like to talk about. The vision is another term. We must have vision. 
If a man or woman does not have vision for the future, your ministry is in severe trouble. You must have vision. And God has given us promises, and we'll talk about that, and I think every one of us here tonight could say, as we reflect over the past, how that God has quickened to our heart and our mind a promise somewhere along the way. And uh, yet the long journey from here to there, the devil and the world and people would like to extract from you the hope of promise. And you have to sometimes get a hold of it. A little tenacity is not bad. To get a hold of it and say, I'm going to hold on till I get what God has promised me. And uh, so from the third chapter, second epistle of Peter, the apostle is saying, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God. Now, I think we all know that this refers to the coming of the Lord. And I will say this, I want to be very clear about it. I believe, predicated upon the Word of God, very strongly in the second coming of Jesus Christ. I do, I do not, that we have here a second coming when, that's the second advent when Christ comes back to earth. But I'm talking first about when he splits the clouds of glory in rapture. And catches his church out. Now if you are a rapture believer. Would you say amen? amen. We need to live every day. With anticipation of the coming of Christ. I mean our labors are not in vain. And we need to live and go to bed every night. And wake up every morning with the hope that Jesus may come today. As a child I remember my father. He was quite a, uh, a, a rapture preacher. And he preached it so strong that. If I wasn't quite right with God, I had trouble going to sleep at night. And I think some of us need to come back to some old-fashioned conviction in our preaching that will bring people to their knees. They cannot sleep or live until they are right with God. But the Apostle Peter is saying that there's going to be scoffers in the last days. Mockers. And they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming since the fathers fell asleep? For all things remain the same as in the beginning, creation. And I'm sure that there are scoffers. But sometimes they're not voicing it audibly, but their actions are declaring that they are scoffing just a little bit at the promise of his coming. But when you see people in prayer, in church, loving God, carrying their Bibles, working fervently, uh, the old, there was a verse to a song that I remember. Uh, sometimes I think of that song. How that, how can I be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others seek to win the prize and sail the stormy seas? Folks, we're engaged in this battle. And until we get there, let's not try to make it always easy on ourselves. Somebody said, if you serve God hard, it's easy. But if you serve him easy, it's hard. So let's just get in. And that goes for preaching. That goes for pastoring, evangelizing, reaching the lost. Let's give it our very best tonight. What do you say? Praise God. It's a long journey. And I'm going to talk about that journey to promise. But get a hold of promise and never give up. Let's lift our hands. Hallelujah. Father, tonight we ask you, breathe upon us as a people. The ministry of, of the Texas district tonight, breathe on this district. Holy Ghost, send us a mighty saving revival. Stir and revive the souls of your people. I'm asking you right now, Father, revive the souls of your preachers. Weary and heavy laden, I ask you to lift them up and undergird them with strength and power and might tonight in the name of Christ.
I ask this. Father, I pray for the anointing of heaven to come down upon this audience and upon this preacher tonight. We cannot preach or worship or receive from you without a holy anointing upon us tonight. And help us to be loyal and committed to truth and to the cause of the kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. It's a long journey. And promise is important. Dreams are important. Visions are important. And it's important that we do not lose our way. I was reflecting some time back, talking with my wife. We have, this year we have been married 44 years. And I reflect back on those early days when we were courting and then married and, and remembering the, the anticipation and the hope of the dream. Uh, as a matter of fact, before marriage, 1957, I remember driving down this road, coming all the way from California and pulling in on the old Texas campground. Right over here to my right, or out in the front of here, to my right, was where the tabernacle was sitting. It was an open-air tabernacle. And I remember pulling up in the yard, and there were automobiles everywhere, and the sound system was on. Those were the days that Brother V.A. Gidros was superintendent. And there was a couple up singing. I can tell you their names. They were singing. He was playing the guitar and she was playing the accordion. And the people were shouting and worshiping God. And I thought, my, this is the biggest thing I've ever been around. And it was big coming from California. I thought how wonderful it was. And then the years that uh, after, shortly after we were married and as we talked of our marriage and our dream and our vision and and our call and what we wanted God to do for us in our life and where he would take us. I had no idea where it would be, but I had some dreams. As a young man, I dreamed of uh, playing the guitar and heard the accordion and we were going to sing and evangelize. We had all those flamboyant dreams and visions out there, preaching revivals and altars filled and and uh, I had no idea where I was going in life, but I knew I wanted to do something. I think that's where a lot of us, we really do not know the end of the journey. But we remember the call and the passion that God placed in our heart. And we, we had that dream when he called us. I tell you what, a man does not have a call that does not have a vision. Vision goes right along with call. It's, it, you know... My father was the founder of a Bible college, and you have such a wonderful Bible college, Texas Bible College, but I can remember he brought missionaries often there, and it seemed to me that every missionary he brought, if they were from South America or the continent of Africa or the Orient or wherever they came from, every missionary, I got a call to that field. I've been called to more fields than you could ever imagine. And he would say, we're going to have a consecration service, so come on in. I did more consecrating than you can ever imagine. Ever at the conclusion of every one of those services, I was in the altar saying, God, I'm consecrating my life. Somebody said, you did a lot of consecrating. Yes, I did. And I have to keep on consecrating. It's not something you reach a utopia of and say, I've, I've, got, I've, I've climbed the mountain and I've achieved and I'm there. But it's something you do every day of your life. You say, God, there's just a little more of me I'm going to lay on the altar. And, and we really don't know where God is carrying us and taking us. This is a journey. And there's some struggles along the way. There's some agony along the way. And I, I, to our candidates for ordination. I'm not attempting to paint a bleak picture. It's a glorious picture. But I want you to understand that there's some trials along the way. And there's some pain along the way. And there's not everything is laughter and, and revival and swinging a guitar or a bass fiddle or an accordion or singing and clapping and dancing and running aisles. There's some times you look for a corner to get into and, 
and you get your old handkerchief out and you begin to sob a little bit in the presence of God you've got to have some strength to go a little bit further and, and you just can't get it by a war hoop right then you need to get along with God and pour out your heart's troubles and say Jesus uh, your servant needs a little help right now I'm on the journey and I know the promises out there and uh, I know there's a vision that you've placed in my heart but the devil's like he wants to bring a deterrent or a distraction. He wants to derail this preacher. But preacher, tonight you've got to fight if you're going to make it. You've got to dig in your heels and say, devil, you're not having any part of my life. See, along the journey, some time ago I picked up an old pictorial album. We had several around our home of conventions way back when I was a boy. I, even before I started preaching, and I remember we had a certain minister in our movement that made several of these pictorial albums, and I, you'd go through them. And I, I think most of us are preachers here tonight, and I attempt to be discreet in the way I talk. But I went through the pictorial album, and it was mostly all preachers, some from general conferences. And way back, I'm talking in the mid 50s and I could say that one's no longer with us he uh, gave up the ministry there was more, a more lucrative for business this one gave up the ministry for pleasure and then there were those that died in the faith they're gone they're not with us there were those that fell by the wayside immorality and as I went through you begin to count them off and the reason I'm doing this tonight you will have ample opportunity to be derailed somewhere along the way you will have an opportunity to choose another path but if God called you you better settle it right now live die sink or swim I'm going to be grieved. I'm going to be hurt. It's not all going to be perfect. But I got a made up mind. God called me. And if I have to pray it through. If I have to get a hold of myself by my collar and talk to myself. I'm going to talk to myself. I'm going to get a hold. If I have to get a brother and say, brother, you got to help me. I'm fighting all hell right now. Be my strength. I make myself accountable to you. I can't really make a good judgment call right now in the frame of mind that I'm in. But I know my heart and I want to make it. And I want to impact my world. And I want to be a preacher of the gospel. I want to love this truth. And I want to stand for this truth. And I want to love this message. And I don't want to waver. I admit there are those that are going this and that way. And they say it's easier that way. But I'm going, to, I'm going to stop right now and tell you. It's never easier that way. It's always easier God's way. And God's way always pays off. Oh, but we can build bigger churches. And I'm going to tell you, that's a lie from hell. Few have ever built bigger churches. First place, God doesn't honor people going that way. He honors them coming this way. They may not have all the truth, but if they're coming this way, they have God's favor. But when they leave this and go that way, they have God's disfavor. You better love the truth. The Bible says, buy it, sell it not. Don't cave in. You're, you're going to be tempted along the way. It's, it's, it's a long journey. And in the 16th chapter of Matthew, Jesus was dealing with his disciples. And there was something so wonderful and contagious about being around Christ. He, he, the way he ministered and blessed people. If you were in Bible times and you were in some of the circles where Jesus ministered and you observed his compassion, his healing power, his compassion on a blind man restoring his sight, his compassion on a deaf person and 
restored hearing or a crippled and his limbs or a leper and cleansed the leper. And you, you, you just, you marveled at the power of God. And there was something so wonderful. And so Jesus was talking with his disciples and at this point in the 16th chapter, and he's saying to them, he's saying, you know, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they're responding. Some of them say that you're Isaiah and others, Elijah. And some even say you're John the Baptist that's been resurrected. And Jesus said, I really want to know who you say that I am. I don't think he's so concerned about what the whole world's talking about. He's more concerned about what the Pentecostals are really believing in him. He said, I want to know what you say. And, and, and Simon breaks the stillness and he said, I know who you are. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed. Oh, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood that didn't, did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. O oh, thou art Peter, upon this rock or this confession or this profound theology or truth, I'm going to build my church. It's on the truth that the church is built. This is a rock. Don't forget it. You can't build on sand and last. You cannot build on fluffy things that are, I mean, it may all look the same while the weather's good. But when the test comes, you'll find out when you build on a rock. I'm going to tell you, this old church has been through the flood. It's been through the fire. It's been through persecution. But the church is still standing. But it's standing on the truth. Then he went on to say, you know, on this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail again. We loved it. They were shouting. It's wonderful. The church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against this church. And we all shout. And I'm going to tell you what. I believe that tonight. I do not believe hell can prevail against this church. I believe the truth will always stand. And Jesus is going to see this church. And so when you hear folks talking about the church falling apart and the church going down, there may be some people falling apart. There may be some congregations falling apart. But the church is not falling apart. The church is on a rock. The church is going forward. The church is still a new birth church. The church is still a one God church. The the church is still a tongue-talking church. The church is still a holy church. This church is not going down. Some people will, but the church will not. So hang in the church. So they shout and rejoice. It's wonderful. Keep on preaching. It's good. Oh, thou art Peter. Upon this rock of Bilma church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give unto you the keys to the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They're all shouting. As a matter of fact, a few chapters over. They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. It got so good up there that Simon said, let's just stay right here and build three tabernacles. There's times that you're on the Mount Transfiguration. There's times that you're getting a little prophecy that makes it sound good. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's times you say, I'm going to give you power and authority. And in my name, you're going to cast out devils. You're going to speak with new tongues. You're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. All of that is scripture. Don't ever deny it. Don't back up from it. But if you go through a little dry place and it doesn't just happen that way, don't turn and throw in the towel. And don't give up and say, well, maybe God doesn't heal today. And maybe folks don't get the Holy Ghost for speaking in tongues today. No, hang on to the word of God and say, I hold the promise and the God's unchanging hand. And then the 16th chapter, he goes on. And as Jesus is moving a little further into the 16th chapter, he says just a few verses down, and then he began to talk to them. 
and he began to warn them of things that were happening. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem. And suffer many things. See, we don't want to suffer. I didn't intend to really get into this tonight. But who wants to suffer? I mean, after all, who even wants to hear Brother Haney preach about suffering? Go, ahead, go back to that subject he was on about gates of hell not prevailing again. Go back to that binding and loosing. But Paul that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Everybody shouts, the power of his resurrection. I want to know him and the fellowship of his suffering. I'm going to tell you, the journey has a little suffering. Just get ready. There's some joy sometimes in suffering. Hallelujah. And then as he spoke to him, he said, I want you to know I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. But he liked the next and be raised again. That's when Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He said, this isn't like you, Lord. I mean, we like the first message you preached. But this message is not very invigorating and challenging. And it's not like you. And he be, begin to rebuke the Lord. And that's when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You don't understand. This is part of the master plan of God. My brother and my sister, if we ever do anything for God, your church you pastor, the evangelistic field you labor in, the mission field that you labor in, there's going to be the element of suffering. But you don't stop. You just dig in your heels. I just promise you, there's one more valley, but there's going to be another mountaintop. And then there'll be another valley, and there'll be another mountaintop. And I was talking, it brings me back to how I started preaching tonight. I said, honey, don't you remember when we talk, were talking about playing the accordion and the guitar and preaching those revival meetings and all those wonderful things? Did you ever think it was going to end up like this? And, of course, I was talking to her then, not about being general superintendent or assistant general superintendent or any, any kind of position. I was talking to her about the trial we was walking through right then. You see, there's not a soul, there's not a preacher, preacher's wife that's in this building, but, but you're going to walk through some fire. You're going to walk through some fire. We, yes, we go to conferences, we go to camp meetings, we go to meetings and we rub shoulders and somebody says, how you doing? And we all say, fine, wonderful, great. And you're bleeding on the inside. And you're cut. And you're torn. And your family's going through excruciating pain. And you're not sure how your kids are going to turn out. And you're not sure about this or that. But you've got to hold on to God's unchanging hand and say, I'm in this thing to the end. I may walk through hell and I may go through it. But God called me. And it's a long journey. It's a long journey, but I'm not going to turn back. Those disciples did not pick up on all the components of the journey. They were only picking up on the, the, the components of glory and victory and miracles and blessings. They didn't really see the suffering and the pain. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, you'll deny yourself. Take up your cross and you'll follow me. I believe with all my heart that we're living in a time when apostolic ministry is essential. It, we've got to have it. And God has promised it to his church. And because you're walking through hell... And you're in the valley doesn't change God's power. Just keep on holding it. 
I'm just like the rest of you preachers. I've walked to the pulpit on Sunday and preached about the apostolic power of God when I felt like all hell and the devil and everybody else was on my shoulders. And I felt like I couldn't go a step further. But I said, I'm going to get up and preach it. You know, as I started preaching, the glory of God and the anointing of God would come on this body. There's times I've walked in the pulpit when I was burning with fever and could hardly drag myself to that pulpit. But I felt I belonged there. And God... God would instantly heal me while I was preaching. I'm going to tell you the power of God is real. Just because you're walking through a valley, it does not change God's power. He is real. He is real. His word is sure. His promises are sure. Don't question the promises of God. Don't lose your vision. Hold on to your vision. I'm preaching to some pastors in this place tonight. When you became the pastor, you, 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 you begin your ministry with a dream and a vision. And you could see the building full and probably the new building being erected. You had all these visions and dreams and then it seemed like the stirring of Satan and evil got into the church. Folks would backslide. Folks would move. We've all faced it. We, I said we've all faced it. I've had folks come by the church in Stockton and act like I never faced those kind of things because there was a few people sitting out there. I'm going to tell you what. I had folks backslide just like everybody else backslide. Slid. I had lawsuits against me just like other folks had lawsuits against them. I walked through being ridiculed and accused falsely. I walked through all of that when they attempted to discredit my character and my family and my preaching and my ministry. What do you do? Throw in the towel and quit? No. You get a grip on God. And you say, I remember when He called me. I remember the place. And I when he put a love in my soul for this message. And you stand right up there. And you look the world in the eye. And you get a hold of heaven. And you keep on preaching. And you say he's the first and he's the last. He's the beginning and he's the end. And all things are in the hands of God. He's still a miracle worker. He's still a God that's our Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. We will not retreat. We will not back up. We will keep on preaching. Uh, we will love this truth and we will love this God. It's a long journey. But you keep on. And you never give in. You just keep on. I mean, when Israel come out of Egypt, they had listened to Moses and Aaron. They had heard their grandmothers talk about that land of promise, the land of Canaan. It was somewhere out yonder that God was going to give them. And they had such dreams and anticipations of that, that beautiful land. They had no idea that it was going to take as long from Egypt to Canaan as it took. They did not see a sea that God had to part. Desert sands, parched tongues, hunger in the body. They never dreamed they would have the end. I mean, if God said go, it's going to be glorious. If God promised us Canaan, we'll get there. He promised you victories, preacher. He promised you revival. He promised you your city. He promised you some souls out there. But he didn't tell you how long it was going to take to get there. But he had enough confidence in you. That he said, if you'll go, I'll go with you. But you just got to hang in there. There's going to be some desert sands. I'm going to have to part the Red Sea a couple times for you. You're going to need some help. The Amakites are going to come on you. 
The Moabites are going to come against you. The Philistines are going to fight you just a little bit. Uh, you're going to face some adversary along the way. In fact, the Egyptians are going to be ever on your trail trying to bring you back down to Egypt. Uh, but if you'll just hold on to me and keep on marching, uh, I'll give you your city. I'll give you everything your heart yearns for. Don't turn back. They got there, and God said, told Moses, said, pick, pick a man from every tribe and send them out there. We call them the 12 spies and, and tell them to do a little research. We want to know, are the cities walled? Are they in the valleys? Are they in the mountains? Are the people few or many? And where do they live? Are they strong? What about the vegetation? What about the land? And he'd give them all this, the, uh, 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 a criteria to find out exactly. Not once was it inferred. He never even questioned or thought. It was never in the mind of God. It was never in the mind of Moses. We may not go. It was always in his, the mind of God. I gave you this land. I promised it to you. And it was in the mind of Moses, their leader. It's ours. We just need to know a little bit more about it before we attacked it. When those 12 spies come back, they said, yes, it's a land of milk and honey. It's got all this wonderful vegetation, but the cities are walled. The people are strong. We saw the sons of Enoch, the giants in the land, and in our own eyes, we look like grasshoppers. And the people begin to cry out against Moses. I'm going to tell you something. The devil would like for you to Look at every situation through your own eyes. But you need to look through the eyes of the Word of God. Because this old book is right. As the song said, hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise God. The book is right. If God promised it to you, He's faithful and just. He will keep His Word and He will keep His promise. I tell you, candidates for ordination tonight, God put a call in you. He's got a plan for your life. Don't let anybody talk you out of it either. Just remember Joseph had his dreams and his biggest obstacles was his brethren. And they wanted to talk him out of it. And I know you love your brethren, but there's sometimes you just better not talk to them about your dream. Just keep it between you and God and you and let it happen. Because there's a little element of jealousy, and I know I'm getting down where we're living, but too bad, too bad. A little element of jealousy that can get in any of us. But we ought to be praying for our brother. As a matter of fact, if you have revival at your church, I ought to be rejoicing at my church. Because when Jesus comes back, he's not coming for 7,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 churches. He's coming for one church. And we are one church with one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God. So there needs to be some rejoicing in the church. Oh, hallelujah. Joseph had dreams. He talked about those dreams. One was, he said, his sheaf, he was telling his brother, and he said, my sheaf stood up, and 11 sheaves fell down before me. And they said, oh, so we're all going to worship you and you're going to have dominion and rulership over us. And the Bible said they hated him all the more. And he didn't have enough sense to keep his mouth shut. I don't know if it was the next day or two days after he had another bit dream. And he, he told it to him again. He said, I saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars. And they all paid obeisance to me. About that time, they were looking at that colored coat he was wearing. And there was anger on the inside. But you know, it's a long story and I don't have time to get into it, but Joseph didn't give up his dream. He went through a whole lot before it come to fruition. And you know, there's just some things I, I jotted down here that I, I want to say to you about your dream. Your vision and your promise meant there are about six or seven things that I noted here. We are tempted in the journey to take the shortcut. 
There's no shortcuts. It's God's way. The shortcut will get you in trouble. If God is God, the Holy Ghost is real. And revival is for us today. Stay with God's way. No shortcuts. Tempted ha, to give up. How many of us have been tempted to give up? I would be less than honest with you tonight if I said I always woke up every morning invigorated and felt like I was ready to take on the giants of the world. There are some mornings I have got out of bed slowly that I wasn't sure I was ready to face the day. It was only with Jesus that I could face that day. And you have been there too. But that is not a time to give up. That is. Ready to face some of the issues that I have to face today. But I know you're God and this is your church. And I'm your servant. And you called me to this ministry. And that's another item that's very important. When you have a call from God. I'm going to tell you that's the greatest thing in all the world. It's not like you said I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a doctor. A plumber. A contractor. A, a call from God carries some weight by it. And there's going to be a time that you're going to need to go back and say. I remember. Remember the time God called me, spoke to my heart, uh, and if I have to stand alone, I still hold to the call that God has given me. Call. Then, when things don't go well, sometimes we want to deny the origin of the dream. Well, maybe it, maybe it was just me. But there's a difference between you. And what God gave you when you was in prayer. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody here tonight. You're sitting out there somewhere. And you've practically given up on where you was going. But the Lord is telling you tonight. He wants to quicken your dream and your vision. He wants to, you to get a new grip on it and say, I'm not quitting. I'm not bowing. I'm not going to give in to you, devil. And I'm not going to give in to you, world. I'm in this for the duration of the journey. And then, when we have a little success, we're tempted to take a trip of self-ego. Another word is just pride. My grandmother, she's in glory, but she, she used to say, I was, when I was young, just pre starting to preach, once in a while I'd get blessed a little bit she could tell when I was blessed and she'd say Kenny you better make sure you don't get proud if I heard her say that once I heard her say it at least 50 times and I used to think how could I ever get proud I can't hardly talk when I get behind the pulpit. I tremble when I get up there. But through the journey, I have found a few opportunities. They was brief, but they was there. But don't forget, we're nothing without him. And then there's the temptation of settling for almost. Al almost. Almost not good enough. I said almost not good enough. I don't want a half a revival. I want a God-given revival. I don't want a half a church. I want as much church as this God's going to give me in this town. I don't want to preach a half a message. I want to preach everything thus saith God. I'm talking about your ministry, your preaching, your teaching, your pastoring, your personal life. Almost is not good enough. And then 
there will be, and there all of us, no doubt, women and men, you have faced some temptation in the journey to cave in to the world or the flesh. But you don't have to. I said, you don't have to. I've heard the flimsy excuses. Well, it was all set up and it was all... The, the devil can set you up every day and you can still be a victor in Jesus' name. You don't have to cave in. Just remember this. Joseph lost two coats, but he never lost his dream. He lost one coat that his brethren stole from him, and he lost another coat when he ran from the tempter. But he never lost his vision, and he never lost his dream. And you don't have to lose your vision or your dream. The world might rob you of your coat, but hold on. The dream of the promise. We will hold on. I don't think at any point, even where we are tonight, there's some of us further along the journey that we can pronosticate the future or tomorrow. But every day you live it in Jesus. I told, talked to brother, I was talking to brother Russell yesterday and brother Rochelle, we were having, sister Rochelle, we were having, and sister Russell having lunch together when I arrived. I was telling them, we, uh, somehow we got into the early days of, of my ministry and I went back and remembered when my father had passed away and I I remember my wonderful days at headquarters I remember as a, the youth president it was short lived two and a half years brother Arlen Gidros, brother Jerry Enzi we worked together brother Bill Sisko in the crusade of Houston and others that are here tonight we worked together those were beautiful memories and wonderful days when I went back to Stockton after the death of my dad I I I knew I belonged there but I did not know I was embarking on a journey that was so much bigger than I was uh, first my father founded that little Bible college I was more geared up to pastor a church, but I didn't know how to handle the school. But it was all kind of dumped in my lap. I believe it was God's will for my life, but I didn't know what to do. But I knew one thing. It was burning in my spirit. I was 34 years old, and it was burning in my spirit. And that burned in my spirit. Build a revival church. Win lost souls. Train young men and women. Send them forth into the harvest field. And so I went about it the best way I knew how. But I, you know, when you ask God to help you build a revival church, you cannot dictate to God who he's going to bring in that church. Hear what I'm saying tonight. You cannot tell God, I want you to bring in some very elite and intellectuals and educated people and some wealthy people in this city and some folks that are well to do. If you want old fashioned revival, if you restrict God telling him who he can save and who he cannot save, you will never have a revival church. And that goes for culture too. I'm talking about the red, the yellow, the black, the white. It does not matter. They are precious in the sight of God. And we are going to have to ask God to help us to become open to the fact that all men are lost outside of truth. And it doesn't help to send thousands of dollars and missionaries to continents overseas and our backyard be full of the same nationalities and we never even give them a track. We're going to have to open ourselves up, United Pentecostal Church. This is a different day. America's ready for a revival. And God wants to send an apostolic, Holy Ghost, tongue talk in Jesus' name, a revival to this church in this hour. This is God's day. But we're going to have to open our minds and change our concepts a little bit and love a little more and care a little more.
It's here. I remember, you know, that church. California now is just a total mixed bag. 51% of the state's population is ethnic. We Caucasians are in the minority. And if you're going to pastor out there, you better get with it. But it wasn't 32 years ago. It wasn't quite that way. And the people I pastored didn't really feel that way. But when I started bringing those buses in there and going out and knocking doors and bringing in everybody that would come, I call it the highway and the byway ministries. Whosoever will go out and bring them in. You should have looked some of the shock looked on some of those faces. And some of those people, but then the revival, some of those humble little people begin to pray through and receive the Holy Ghost, take teaching and Bible studies, and they begin to line right up and they come to church and they didn't drag into church. They got there early and they filled those pews. And it amused me when some of those old timers that had been around there forever walked in and their pew was filled up. They thought they owned that pew. Sometimes I think that's the way we think in the United Pentecostal Church. If the United Pentecostal Church has the kind of revival that God wants to give the United Pentecostal Church. Now hear me. Don't be offended with me tonight. But I just want to tell you. If God starts revealing himself to the Baptists down here. And to the Assemblies of God over here. I mean God can do that. I'm telling you God can do it. Now they're going to have to come our way. We're not going that way. But if God starts revealing, is, is that maybe what we're worried about? Them coming in and, and becoming licensed with the United Pentecostal Church and taking our presbyterships and our leadership of the United Pentecostal Church? Is that what we're worried about? We better become kingdom-minded and ask God to help us to understand this is His church. I'm preaching to you tonight what God wants to do. And don't read anything into what I'm saying tonight. I'm not saying that we're going their way and we're going to join and have great fellowship with them. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about teaching the Word of God, preaching truth and loving truth and letting God work with them. As a matter of fact, you may not expect this. I don't care if they never come with us. It might be difficult for them to come with us. My dad used to tell me, son, we talk about holiness. I'm preaching longer than I intended to, but just let me preach. He said, son, you don't know how long it took us to become what we are. He said, I, I was there in the merger. I was there. He said, we wasn't unified. We, we had a lot of things going on that wasn't right. It's taken us years t to be taught, to be trained, to look right, to dress right. And he wasn't thinking in the context that I am thinking of. But you can't expect... Please hear me. Don't, don't read one thing into this if you please don't. But you can't expect a Baptist preacher or any, forget the denomination, somebody over here to see this revelation and become so excited about it. Because I know Jesse Williams told me about a man that he's had preach at his pulpit that was Methodist, that is filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, and said, Brother Haney, he is so thrilled with it. And he come right in, and his wife said, Oops, I'm not going. If you go that way, I'm leaving you. I mean, we've been born in this. My kids are married, intermarried in this. But when they come and see the light, they're thinking, my kids are over here. My grandkids are over here. I'm telling you, don't be too hard on them too quick. And that's why I'm saying, they may never come with us, but if we can leap over that wall with some truth. Just leap over it a little bit. Let the truth go in there. Let God work. Revelation come. I see it. He's God. 
Let's baptize one another in Jesus' name. Look at, we don't look right. We're, we're looking like Hollywood. This isn't right. But they're not going to come overnight. But I want to say this, that the thing that always worries me about this, and I know this is what, that, that some of us will say, well, maybe we should just go a little bit that way to help them. If you do that, you've ruined everything God's trying to do. I don't know if you like it, but I'm preaching what I want to preach and I'm bearing my soul and this is what I feel in my heart. God wants to give the United Pentecostal Church the greatest revival. I've been asking the Lord, why do we exist, God? What did you bring us to this hour for? And I believe He brought us here in many ways to become a conscience to those over here. But if you cave in and act like them, you'll not be a conscience. Hear what I'm saying? This is the dream that should be birthed in our spirits, preachers. We ought to wake up in the morning, pray for our families, pray for our churches, pray for one another, and then pray that revelation and truth will sweep this planet and sweep this world. Yeah. We start praying, God will do great things, and He'll open doors and use you. No, I don't intend to go that way. We've come too far. And we're right with God where we're at. And young preachers, let me encourage you. This is it. Stay with it. God's going to say. You see, one plants, one waters. Who is it that gives the increase? Come on, who is it that gives the increase? It's God that gives the increase. Keep on planting, keep on watering, keep on preaching. Teach those Bible studies. Be kind to those people. He'll give the increase. Yes, the promise isn't far away. And I'm holding on to it. And I'm saying, Jesus, wake him up. And I got to close. One Methodist bishop stood before several of us and said, and this was like three years ago, but two years ago now, he said, Brother Heaney, I've been baptized in Jesus' name because it just come to me that it's right. And this minister was standing with him, an African-American preacher who was a member of the United Methodist Church. And he said, and I've been baptized too in Jesus' name. And I've received the Holy Ghost and I speak in tongues. And then he said, you can't believe how many Methodist preachers out here are so empty and void. And they're looking. And he said, then he turned to us. There was a group of us and he said, don't change anything. Just be what you are. Because we're looking at you. And we're watching. I'm telling you preachers tonight. There's something going on bigger than any of us know here. There's a God in heaven. There's a revival in the making. This is no time to backtrack. This is no time to give up. This is a time to hold on and wake up every morning and say, The promise isn't far away. We've got to have a bigger picture than our four no more. We've got to see this thing as through the eyes of Jesus. Hallelujah. But don't give up. Hold on. Would you stand with me tonight? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Reach over and take somebody by the hand right now. Just, just if it's your wife, preacher, take her hand. There's somebody by you, just take their hand. Start saying, God, I want you to use me. God, I want you to use me. I want my mind. I want my spirit. I want to be in your perfect will. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Don't let us lose sight. 
where you brought us from and what you want to do with us today. Raise your voice, church. Just raise your voice, preachers. Just raise your voice, sisters. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let this be an hour of anointing. got a hold of the promise in you here tonight the dream is still alive the revival you've been waiting for and believing God for it's going to happen it's going to happen thank you brother Haney thank you for preaching your heart but more than the heart your heart tonight, the heart of God and God's desire for His church. I'm going to ask the district board to join us, Brother Haney, Brother Cisco, Brother Neely, Brother Williams. Let's go right down here in the level where the candidates are. Congregation may be seated. We come to the part of the service tonight, and I want the candidates to remain standing for just a moment. When the charge is given. The message has been preached tonight. About the dream. And the promise. That promise is for you. And for you. But tonight we are privileged to have. Brother William Sisko with us. The father of brother Jason Sisko how honored we are to have him. He's going to come tonight with the charge that will be given to you as our nation candidates tonight. Brother Cisco, come. We're privileged. Thank you for this opportunity. 2 Timothy 1 and 11 whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the gospel and a teacher of the Gentiles, I'm sorry. That was the King James. 
in the NIV, it says, in this end of this gospel, I was a, appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know not what, who, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I want to say when we're dealing with a charge not another person Brother Martinez and Sister Martinez Brother and Sister Cisco not another person will feel as you feel this night. God is in attendance and he's looking at you for people because the great responsibility that you have to go into all of the world you're going to have to go when you don't feel like it. I want to point out a, a few key words I'm not going to take long appointed a herald he said I was appointed a herald a herald is one who serves with honor and influence known for their strong voice and eloquent speech endued with wisdom and eloquence from above so says Adam Clark a herald someone who serves with honor I thank God my son grew up and he saw many people come to our home to our church he saw people who served with honor and he recognized that a preacher an apostle sent from God to man that's what you are you're a preacher you're a herald God has called you and if he's called you you have authority that no one else can have a teacher is one whose business is to instruct men you have a responsibility to hold what you have been given. This responsibility is an integral part of your thinking. It is a responsibility to God and to men that you hold. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the Spirit killeth, for the, excuse me, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You are servants. We're all servants who pick up what Jesus Christ called us to do. We're first servants to God and then men. For if we do not put God first, we will have nothing to give God or give men from God so important that you love truth we have never lived in a time like we're living now 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 and with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved oh in my spirit this this evening 
I know the hour is late, but give me just a moment just to say this. You have to love the truth. That's what's going to liberate people from their sin. That's what's going to bring the anointing into your life. And when you speak and you love the truth, people are going to know that you're different. From the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit, listen and give heed to the words in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. And this was the charge that he gave. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So I charge you, that you recognize you are appointed. So I charge you to be one sent from God to man. So I charge you with the responsibility to serve and to love the truth and to understand that what you're doing, it doesn't matter if the whole world is against you, if God be for you. This didn't come out of some creed this came out of the anointed word of God. Take it serious. It will make all the difference in the world. Hallelujah. I'd like for the candidates to stand and their wives. If you'd move up two steps, come forward. Brother Prince will present now the towel of service. This represents the servant spirit, exemplified by our Lord when he met with his disciples, girded himself with a towel, and our Lord and Master knelt at their feet and began to wash their feet. Brother Cisco has said it so clearly. You're a servant. We learn that we're not lords over God's heritage. He is the Lord. The churches that He has given us are not churches that we founded. But they were churches and souls purchased with His own blood. We stand here redeemed tonight, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but through his mercy and through his grace. Your service to him, the writer of Romans said, is but a reasonable service. And whatever we face in life, both the good times and the hardships, counted an honor to just be a servant for one day he's coming back every work that we have done in his name he will honor and I pray that through your ministry many souls will be given to you and at that great day, when we stand before him, your duty as a servant will be to give a report of those that God has given you. 
So tonight, in a service that has been officiated by our general superintendent, Brother Haney, has been anointed and touched by the presence of Almighty God, I'm going to ask the presbytery to come, our elders that are here with them, and to lay hands on you. And an impartation of new power and a touch of His Spirit and a great anointing can rest upon your ministry. Brother Gidrose, I want you to join us in this. And while we pray, I want this congregation, if you'll stand, and we're going to pray together. It would be a good time for you, minister. And I speak humbly to you tonight. But it would be a good time to renew some things in your ministry. Hearing what we have heard tonight from our general superintendent. But feeling what we're feeling right now in the sanctity of this moment. It would be good for all of us as we pray to renew something on inside of us as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us pray, presbyters, please, gather around these. Brother Haney, please come. Hallelujah. Please like, comment, and subscribe.